Good combination with what we're talking about today. Steve, make the roots connection. This, the, your last piece is about several things. It's about the Huxley family, but it's about your own family, and it's on the general theme that that uh, family emotion is somehow uh, six or sixty-six degrees removed from the whole story. Well, Chris, I think it is the point you made in your introduction, and in truth, I don't understand it. It's something psychologically deep within us. Why does the subject of evolution fascinate us so deeply? It's not only that it's overwhelmingly factually documented, because many things are that don't touch us to the core in that sense or incite our interest. I think it is the roots phenomenon writ large. For some reason, we understand that we're tiny, little, cosmically insignificant creatures in this immense universe. We've always known that. That's what the psalmist said in that famous line in Psalm 8, which in the King James Version literally only speaks about half of us, but means all of us, right? What is man that thou art mindful of him? How, how can we mean anything in this immensity of it all? And one of the ways we deal with that is to embed ourselves, because we're small and we live here in our individual lives for a tiny bit of time into this larger immensity, immediately into our own family lines by tracing our own lineages back further into the family lines of the phyletic history of the creatures we share the planet with. It, it hits us hard, and that's why I did make that mm. comparison. I wrote essays for Natural History magazine for 300 months in a row and never missed one. And somehow that got me musing. I'm not going to stop writing, of course. I'm just going to stop writing monthly for Natural History Magazine. One could as soon stop writing as stop breathing. That's when I'll stop writing, of course. But uh, I thought that for the last essay, I'd try and make that point explicitly. It is amazing when you think about it. Life has been here for three and a half billion years. If it had ever ended for one second, we wouldn't be here. The skein would have been broken forever. How many how many processes can go on that long, and never once cross the zero line? <laughs> it's almost I, mean, I don't realize the probability of crossing that zero line may be very low, but you had three and a half billion years and never to have done it once. That is a record of astonishing proportions. It leaves Mr. DiMaggio and essays, strings, and anything else human beings have done utterly in the dust. And yeah, I thought you, to you, celebrate you that, it, you I, compare it. You know, it, it, a healthy Mark McGuire. Uh, yeah, the reason I make you, 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 the question is, what is it that explains that could explain uh, the continuity? The fact that it, it, the light never went out three and a half yeah, billion never years. Never once. Yeah, the reason I made the comparison to McGuire, what I said was that. You know, if you had McGuire playing for three and a half billion years, there might be one year where he'd hit zero home runs. It's very improbable, but it wouldn't make the phenomenon go away. He'd be back next year. But life doesn't work that way. If life had ever crossed that zero line, however improbable, even once, it would have ended. We wouldn't be here. And yet here we are in this enormous richness of millions of species of organisms. The Earth never froze. The sun never exploded. The uh, earth was never struck by a body large enough to wipe out all of life. It's astonishing. It's factual, but it's astonishing, and here we are. Go back to the story of your grandparents, and it is a sentimental story, uh, but it's full of, it's full of um, the stuff of connection. I, I wonder oh, sure. what you meant to say, though, about the strategies, the bonding, the accidents, the chance, the the learned uh, rules of success in a migration, in a new country, oh, I, of these two people who had not just an interesting life, but interesting children and grandchildren, what, beside the mere fact of uh, continuity, what do you learn from their story uh, about the tactics of it and the setbacks of it um, about the, the main, bigger story? I think the main point I was trying to make is how utterly ordinary... The story is in its heroism, and that everyone's family line has a tale like that. It was a good way to end the series, because my grandfather landed in the United States as a 14-year-old boy in 1901. This is my last essay for January 1901. And the reason I knew the date is that I have his old, humble, little English grammar book that he bought a month after he landed here. 
And he wrote on it, first the date of his acquisition, October 25th, 1901, and then he wrote just below it in pencil, in this very elegant European hand, with incorrect grammar, because he didn't know the difference among the various past tenses of English yet. He wrote, I have landed, September 1st, 1901. And he should have wrote, I landed, because he was talking about something he'd done a couple of months ago. But, hey, he didn't know the difference between the compound and the simple past yet. And somehow that was just so eloquent, I have landed. And that date allowed me, thanks to a reader who turned out to be a researcher in passenger list, to send me the manifest. And I ended up with this piece of paper showing his arrival on Ellis Island, this humble little piece of paper announcing Josef Rosenberg from his tiny little town in eastern Hungary. And my grandmother's story was similar. She came ten years later, had had a falling out with her father, came under the sponsorship of an aunt in 1910. In 1911, on the day of the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire, she was a shirtwaist worker, but working for another company a few blocks away. It's through the luck of things like that that people join and get together. They met, they married, they had four children. One of them's my mother. They struggled, they reached the lower bounds of the middle classes. They prevailed. Um, my you speak of, of luck, had... but you also make it sound inevitable. Is anything in the Darwinian scheme inevitable? Oh, no, there's nothing inevitable. That's the heroism of it. I think that's the problem with inevitability. It's the problem with all fatalist points of view, even if you don't know what you're destined to be, and therefore, in a sense, you may be surprised by it. Somehow, philosophically, the very fact that it needs to occur, I think, detracts from its glory. No, it was a strange mixture of fortitude and good fortune, and that's why any of us are here today, but you need the fortitude as well as the good fortune, and that's why we can call such stories heroic in the usual human sense of that term. It's not just luck, and it's not just skill. Steve, put it in the in the general context of sort of Darwinian thinking, Today, of course, Darwin, although himself he, he was ambiguous about uh, religious faith, he did take sort of God's creative hand in making those individual species uh, sort of out of the process. Uh, a lot of people go vastly further to say there's no, there's none of this human emotion to be associated with this process. Uh, none of your kind of fervent uh, excitement, enthusiasm, awe. Uh, human and emotional connection uh, to be associated with it. How how risky is it to kind of uh, not anthropomorphize exactly, but to see so much uh, human resonance in this long process? Oh, I think you have to make a strict separation, Chris. In that sense, I'm totally with Darwin. Whatever Darwin's personal religious views, I don't think he ever figured it out. He would have borrowed his friend Huxley's term agnostic to describe himself. He certainly felt that there might be some force that we would want to call creative in a conventional sense behind the general laws of nature, but he certainly argued that the actual particular events that occur, the birth and death of each species over three and a half billion years, is a question to be understood by scientific investigation. And, oh, and I very much agree with that. In even to be able to talk about its awesomeness or its impact upon you, I think you do have to make a strict separation between its ascertainable scientific status and what it means to you. Those are separate subjects. There's a factuality out there, which is whatever it is, whether we like it or not, and that factuality then speaks to our emotions in a certain way, and it will not speak to everyone in the same way. And I think as long as we keep those separate, I think it is the job of a scientist to recognize that however a certain set of facts is best understood impacts his own emotions has to be kept separate insofar as you can. I mean, obviously, we're drawn to study certain subjects. Why am I a paleontologist rather than a physicist? In part, it's because I don't do that kind of mathematics, but in part, it's what struck me personally. But I have to keep as much as I possibly can that separate from my assessment of the factuality of nature. I want to uh, continue the uh, the thought into this uh, uh, thicket of sociobiology, which is suddenly crawling again and 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 burning around the Yanomami question and the uh, Napoleon Chagnon research in 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 the Amazon uh, regions of 
South America. This has churned up a huge new war again with the uh, uh, with Patrick Tierney's book Darkness at El Dorado, and suddenly this whole question of uh, whether it's genes that make people fierce or something else, whether indeed the Yanomami were all that fierce before Shagnon got there, um, uh, how it should be explained. Uh, what's, the, what's the short Steve Gould take on the question of relating uh, evolution